before we start, let's uh, just take a few moments to think about what, why we're here um, as individuals and what we're trying to do in our own, the development of our spiritual path primarily in terms of not necessarily anything mysterious or magical, but more to do with trying to, trying to do what we can, um, even in a small way, in a mental way, uh, uh, um, uh, to, to make the world a better place. So uh, it's hard to argue that that's a bad idea. Um, and um, we've got to be aware of our own limitations and that's okay. Um, uh, uh, and within the bigger picture as Buddhists, then we would also say we're trying to extend ourselves to a point where we become Buddhas. Um, Buddhas being, as we discussed last week, the best, being in the best position to help and meet every, everyone's needs spontaneously and effortlessly uh, with a compassion that is um, unending and, uh, and, um, uh, and unspoiled. So it's uh, whatever we can take on then, I think, is to try to think uh, this session anyway, I'm going to do my best to um, be determined to help train my mind to consider things, um, how, how I could, what I can do, um, either um, from what Ben says or from what Ben, um, or from, from um, learning from what Ben gets wrong, um, or from what Ben doesn't say, say provide me or, or allow myself to develop, to, um, to, to take on more of a challenge, to be uh, responsible for the universe as much as we can, um, and in that way, uh, we can really make a substantial um, difference. We might not see it, we might not be able to measure it ourselves, but even having that motive, um, having that um, sense of commitment is very, very powerful, especially on our deeper levels of consciousness. Um, so, and, and that it exhibits itself in our behaviors. So last week we talked about going for refuge and going for refuge specifically to the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. And um, of that, we looked at why, uh, uh, what it means to be enlightened as a Buddha and what it means to be enlightened uh, in general, in the general stages, the path, which I presented in the Mahayana tradition. Um, and then what we looked at was uh, what the eligibility of Buddha as a, as a refuge um, and how, while initially as young babies, uh, our natural refuge is the mother, as we wish to take refuge from um, uh, the woes of samsara and conditioned reality, we need to turn to a, a, a more able refuge in, in, in that sense. Um, and therefore, um, the same sort of thing like um, uh, having a re good relationship with a mother is sort of, I think, within modern um, psychology is known as attachment theory, um, is very similar to having a good relationship with the Buddha, the Buddha Dharma Sangha. And therefore, on our side, it doesn't really matter, by their side, what matters on our side is that we have developed that trust and that security and recognize that stability with um, Buddha Dharma Sangha as, 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 a, as a viable and a safe refuge for us in our journey to enlightenment. So I think often people get confused because the word attachment often is used in Buddhism in a negative context and attachment theory appears to say that attachment is good. But in the end, really, a lot of this is about terminology and, and so on. And the way that I see it is that refuge is um, the Buddhist word for attachment in this sense. So um, it's not as if, I, I mean, somebody might be able to say, like Ben, you're just making it up, but it seems to make more sense to me that that works. So this week, what we want to do is to move on from the idea of saying, having taken refuge, recognize the refuge and taking refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha, um, accepting um, and being willing to accept um, uh, 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 the Buddha and especially the Dharma as being 
a reliable um, or, 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 or uh, um, help for us to uh, tread the path, tread the path of enlightenment. And that's important because if we have doubts about, oh, and doubts uh, are, are, are not unusual, um, but if we allow our, our doubts to continue or to, to, to grow um, about the Dharma and about the path uh, to enlightenment, then we will also feel that there's, we could feel despondent, there is no future, there is no, um, there's no Dharma available to us. And then we might think, well, if we can't find it with the Buddha Dharma, where else could we look? And, and in terms of the path to enlightenment, that makes it much, much harder for us to, to identify a safe haven, especially considering in this sense that Buddha says to us um, in various sutras, you know, find out for yourself, don't just rely upon me. So while there are many people or, 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 um, or, or traditions which are, say, I'm, all, I'm authentic and you can trust me for that, but it says, don't just trust me, find out inside. And that specific thing for me personally is really important because it says, I don't need you to, 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 to believe that I'm, I'm authentic. I am saying to you, you can find that out. And uh, that is a, a, a very, very empowered uh, position to stand. It's like there's a, a complete uh, faith um, um, and conviction in, in, in the the verity, the, the, the truthfulness of what is being spoken. So this week, we're moving on to the precepts of refuge. So the precepts of refuge are what, having taken refuge, having recognized that we've taken refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha, or that we take refuge because it's not just something that happens in the past, it happens continually. What we're then doing is to say, well, what does that mean? How does that look? How, how, how do I know, how do I experience um, at my refuge? How does that affect me? And of course, one of the aspects of this is going to be very clearly um, uh, re relying upon uh, uh, the, 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 the Triple Dram, the, the, the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So in this particular case, Lama Tsongkhapa says to us um, that he wants to explain it in um, in, in accordance to uh, the compendium of uh, determinations as one of these core texts, and also um, has been taught him through the oral tradition. Um, and then within this, the first one, we're going to look primarily at two sets of sub subdivisions. Now, before we go on to this, the, um, the normal way in, the pre in which we are taught uh, the, pre the, the refuge precepts um, at school or in, in, in uh, education or in, in many classes is that there are sort of five basic uh, uh, refuge rules or, or, or behaviors and this is you know not to kill, not to steal, not to uh, commit sexual misconduct, uh, not to lie and, and not to drink. And you, you find this in, in, in Tibetan tradition as well, it's not unusual. But here these those five which are um, often taught as the, the precepts of refuge, uh, Lama Tsongkhapa does not choose to do that because he introduces those um, later on in terms of the 10 uh, virtuous and, uh, and non-virtuous actions. Um, so these particular uh, um, uh, uh, um, ethical uh, uh, agreements, he, he still uses them, still talks about them, still says this is what we need to do but what he wants to do now is not just talk about a bunch of rules but the meaning behind those rules so he says first of all the the, the very first step of this is to rely upon excellent people and um primarily um you he says um we've already talked about this within teaching um and is when we recognize uh, teachers, reliable teachers, as a source of all good qualities, um, we then are able to uphold such teachers uh, as, a, as a part of our path to um, the teachers of the path um, as uh, representing Buddha in the refuge. So again, this is a, as, as I sort of went very on in, in detail about last time, uh, a few months ago, we were talking about uh, uh, guru yoga or guru practice, 
that that doesn't mean that um, if one's teaching can get away with anything, quite the opposite. They need to be held up um, very clearly and closely uh, for their actions, but primarily is to do with saying when we, are, we do have a relationship with a teacher, like for instance, His Holiness Dalai Lama, uh, um, then or, or the teachers who've helped me uh, or us in the Lam Rim tradition, then for us, we can say, yes, this, they've been the gateway, they've been the gateway to open the Dharma um, as a, as a um, heart tradition, rather than just, a, 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 just an academic tradition. They've shown a, a transmission of mind, if you like. And this is, what, this is what, why um, Lama Tsongkhapa was saying that we need to remember that our spiritual teachers help to open us up. And, and at that point, then we can begin to really relate to Buddha. So as a part of our relationship with um, our refuge as Buddha is to allow ourselves to recognize when we can or when we have the opportunity to open ourselves up to our teachers. And again, he says, B, secondly, is also to listen to the, the, to the, uh, the sublime teachings and fix our attention properly on them. Um, and he says, and this is quite important, he says you should, should listen to what, what is appropriate among the sutras and the like, teachings which are sublime, because the Buddha and the Buddha's uh, students uh, explain them to us. Um, in addition, fix your attention on what serves to dispel our afflictions, uh, uh, ignorance, um, uh, uh, anger, and so on. Uh, for, for Because we've chosen to um, uh, uh, take refuge in, in the Dharma, in the teaching, therefore uh, it is important for us to actualize the verbal uh, teachings and the teachings as they are realized. Um, and the, the practice that conforms with this is not just listening to, but also learning to uh, apply our attention to me or to meditate upon these teachings. Now, um, um, the word appropriate is sort of relevant here because it's understanding how um, and it was said in the very first week of, Lamrim, of the Lamrim Chemo teaching is, is that um, what is appropriate is, is in, in general to recognize that there's a vast number of different um, teachings given um, by Buddha and his disciples over the, many, over the last two and a half thousand years or more. And um, some of those, and they all can be seen as advice to help us in terms of our enlightenment. But it is also relevant for us to recognize those which we find help us in our journey and those which are not so helpful to us in our journey without being judgmental or critical because we recognize that inclusively uh, different um, uh, different practitioners and different traditions have uh, different relationships with different aspects of the sutras and, and the tantras and, 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 the, and the commentaries and, and all the and many 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 um, hundreds of thousands of texts that there are so this also goes on to, and one could argue that this is also again inclusively includes other religions, that um, there are times when uh, other religions are very useful for, for, for people who, are, who, who have a strong relationship with those, and, and, um, and for us to criticize those or to mark them down is a mistake. We are an inclusive faith. Not an not a not a, a, a exclusion and not an exclusionary faith. I think maybe that's not quite the right word, but um, therefore, but we also must be determined that just because we are inclusive does not mean that we need to learn every different single faith, every single different tradition of every single faith. We don't need to learn even all the different uh, traditions within Buddhism for us to be able to. Uh, when we're concentrating on developing our practice. Now, later on, as I said, when we're working with being able to meet the needs of different students, we need to be able to have the ability to meet those according to the language with which they speak. And I'm, I mean this not in a terms of learning French or German, but in terms of the, 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 the language of the faith that is being practiced. So in that sense, uh, you might argue that um, uh, it is easier to talk to a Christian about um, uh, um, uh, um, the importance of uh, Jesus's teachings than it is to talk about Buddha's teachings without being presumptive, but primarily to, um, to try to build rapport or relationship um, to establish what is our goal, which is not conversion, is not persuasion, but is to help assist empower 
people on their own spiritual path to become better people, which is all we are interested in doing. So therefore, what we're saying is, is that we have to be quite close sometimes in terms of um, thinking, oh yeah, especially if we're quite strong in our uh, strong in our practice, we need to limit our practice to that which is relevant to what we need to be learning in terms of our own practice. Um, and and then at the same time, not uh, uh, once we are once that is stable, not allow ourselves to become sort of exclusionary and sort of say this is the only, this is the one, this is the true path, which doesn't make any sense. It doesn't help us in the short term. Or it certainly doesn't help us in the long term. So from that point of view, um, but it is important for us to recognize, for instance, that if we are Mahayana practitioners, we're looking at trying to reach the needs of all beings, we're dedicated to Buddhahood, then we could read sutras which belong to the Sravaka tradition or to the Pracheka tradition, which are very, very um, uh, 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 closed down in terms of your activities. Uh, and like, for instance, if we are lay people, then learning Vinaya is not necessarily going to help us because it's not relevant to our daily needs. And, and, and to me, the most important thing is, and, and following um, my teachers, is it, to, be, to remain practical, to remain practical, responsible and sensible. So it's not about um, learning lots of different things. It's, it's learning how to move from the heart. And I think one of the things I'm going on about when I talk about inclusivity is also is that there is a point, especially when we develop empathy, where we might not know the language of uh, different uh, spiritual practitioners, but we will be able to see, um, we, uh, we will be able to build a rapport regardless because of the depth of our own practice. Yeah, it's not magical. Again, it's, it's just primarily because there are so many shared aspects of faith in terms of recognition of the journey of the path, a recognition of the need to um, uh, to uh, uh, restrain, if you like, or to contain our um, more um, childlike nature. Yeah. So I think contain is a better word than restrain. We're not really like trying to hold hold back. We're trying to contain it so that it remains safe, steady, steady and stable. So uh, um, um, and then um, he, uh, uh, J. Rinpoche says, uh, we, we cultivating this practice which conforms with the teachings, which is what I've just been talking about. And here he says we should practice in accordance with the teachings on Nirvana. So Nirvana is uh, normally taught within the Pali uh, Theravada tradition, but all he's saying here is remember what we're here for is enlightenment, right? Enlightenment is what we're here for. Um, and in fact, what we're engaging in is enlightening back, uh, activity according to what we have learned and can understand. And therefore, in terms of our refuge, it is only sensible for us to engage in, in, in those activities which help develop us, it help empower, develop uh, and augment our abilities and our abilities in, in specifically to be more responsible, to be more kind, be more able to, to, to benefit. So this is the first set of subdivisions that he mentions uh, uh, from the Compendium of Determinations. The second ones are not to excite our sensory, um, sensory faculties. So prim primarily, this goes back to what I was saying earlier on about containing, is uh, when we are untrained, uh, untrained practitioners uh, or, or not used to training as ourselves, is we often allow our emotions to run away and we can feel quite just in doing that. Uh, especially if we feel that, you know, um, well, it's outrageous what happened and one can get one's onto one's high horse or whatever. And, and at that point, it's like, um, it feels right to be, you know, justly, that's just wrong, I'm going to do something about that. And we have to be very, very careful, because essentially, when we get passionate about stuff, we are no longer really containing ourselves, we're no longer cherishing ourselves in terms of providing that safe, um emotional containment right so it's not about us loving ourselves more than anybody else it's not like we're looking out for number one we're actually looking out for number everyone but the way in which we do that is to be able to contain and to sustain our emotional um uh, equanimity if you like so this is not to excite not to, to to allow our sensory faculties to become excited and again this is like this can go 
um, uh, in terms of lust, in terms of uh, you know desire or attraction, compulsion, fear, running away from you know, or, 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 as well as fury and, and jealousy, and all of these things uh, lead to uh, pride, sense of pride, um, and sometimes just a sheer sense of. Um, uh, you know, sort of greed. I want more strawberries. I know I need more strawberries. I've got to have more. I, I, it's not good. I've had three. I want to finish the punnet, and then of course we get sick. So, so it's those sorts of things where we're looking at providing that emotional containment within ourselves, um, and that's how we begin to demonstrate uh, not only to ourselves but to everybody that we're with, and and into the future, uh, that sense of, uh, of being able to look after ourselves and being able to be responsible. He then says we need to go, we take up the precepts correctly. So here he says, uh, you know, he says um, the training that uh, is set forth by Buddha, uh, d take on as many as you can. But he said, be realistic. You know, he's saying being realistic. Don't take on everything and then think, oh, my goodness, I failed completely. I can't do anything at all. Far better, again, uh, to do small, safe steps to have to take on saying, OK, actually, I know that um, uh, uh, this key concept, which is now um, crossed uh, the whole world of um, ahimsa, yeah, uh, non-harm, and maybe I, I I can start thinking about uh, a little bit in my life about how to sustain non-harm. And initially, it seems very simple, right? It's a trivial. Uh, common sense idea, but when we begin to look at the, uh, the, 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 the full consequences of non-harm, then it's much more complex. Now, it doesn't mean, of course, if we're a surgeon that we shouldn't be using a knife to, to open people up. This is not non-harm, right? So again, we have to also think clearly about, about what, um, uh, what is and what is not non-harm. And of course, we can find texts that can describe this in great detail. But also we can use our own creative intelligence to think clearly about whether or not non-harm as a concept, uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a behavior, allows or disallows our activities in certain cases. Um, moving on from that, and this is just one, I mean, non-harm is just one of the many different precepts, you know, not to steal, another one, again, uh, uh, like, uh, cued, you know, um, um, uh, fair dodging right or tax dodging is is that theft well why not so if it isn't a, or like if i get a freebie that's sort of just been left there am i really stealing and is, we will have to be very careful about these if we've decided that we can accept this precept then we need to be able to say okay well actually this is what makes me a practitioner this is what make this is what defines me as a practitioner is that i've i've given up or i am giving up or i'm attempting to give up uh, uh, stealing. So we, it starts off, it's like, well, of course I don't steal. And then when we start thinking about it, say, well, actually, and then it's like, okay. <laughs> so what, we have to be like, well, only if, only if, you know, well, that doesn't count because it was, you know, or whatever. It's like saying, you know, for instance, uh, um, lots of people um, uh, get software from their friend or whatever it happens to be. And it's like, well, you know, it was difficult. So we have to be very quite careful about about where we um, or listening to you know uh, I don't know nowadays it's a bit different but you know copying a CD of music or whatever it happens to be. So I've done these things. You know, I mean, I, I have been practicing, trying to practice for nearly forty, uh, more than forty years now, right? So fifty years, and and still I sort of like think about it. It's like yeah, I could do better, right? So it is important to get these correct. So then the other, uh, and moving on to the subdivisions here, we're also saying being compassionate to all living beings. So being compassionate to all living beings is uh, a, one of the aspects, and it, again, if we think about it, is one of the distinguishing features of Buddha, is that Buddha is compassionate without exception to all beings in the past, present, and future. And we are trying to become a Buddha, or we're trying to learn how to be a Buddha. So in that sense, for us to think that compassion isn't relevant is sort of missing the point. We are working on that loving kindness, that consideration, the empathy, the insight, the ability, the responsibility, uh, uh, the serenity 
all these qualities are, 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 are what we're working towards, and they don't differ from Buddha. I've talked about this before a few weeks ago. So in that sense, what we're looking is actually a Buddha and a practitioner. Uh, the distinction is only really in terms of ability, in terms of experience. We are working towards the same uh, uh, sort of a concordant set of practices. Um, so therefore, of course, um, we should be looking to be compassionate towards all beings or having developing love and kind kindness. And even though uh, Jay Rinpoche already has talked about precepts, he also says we should give up harming all sentient beings. So this is specific, right? Then again, in terms of our practices, is to strive to make periodic offerings to the three jewels. Offerings. So one of the things about this is that there's a tendency for us, or maybe it's just me, um, to sort of remember when the, the, the bag used to go around the church or whatever, and people used to put the money in. And I felt very uneasy about that, mainly because I didn't have very much, but also it felt like the, 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 the the, the, the church was just trying to, you know, get, take our money, if you like. Um, and what we see in, especially with Jerem Shane later on, we'll be talking about uh, this, is making offerings to the three jewels sort of sounds a little bit like that. But the point about this, and we go into this in more detail, is that the act of, uh, of generosity, of making offerings within Buddhism is recognized as the same as the act of love. Now, if you think about it, actually, not the act of love in terms, sorry, that sounds like sex. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm saying um, the, 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 loving, uh, uh, the loving kindness or loving, a loving nature. So um, when we uh, think about um, visiting our family, we we either are offered meals or we 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 wish to make meals to offer, and that is a way of us expressing our love for our family. Right? This is not even remotely unusual. So um, we see that this this act of giving is primarily a, a very very deep biological uh, response to a, a, or expression of uh, demonstrating our sense of love or, or kindness, loving kindness. And again, so therefore, what we're trying to do is to open up our hearts to, to Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And as we're doing that, we want to try to demonstrate a similar love uh, that we would do in terms of offering a meal. And this is why the bowls and so on that were done in preparation of meditation, which I mentioned a few weeks ago, this likewise too is, is a way of being able to just use water to offer uh, um, a sort of uh, different waters in terms of representing a, um, uh, flowers and food and so on as a way of offering to the triple gem so the meaning here is opening our hearts uh, not about giving uh, you know them doing fundraisers so these are the ones that belong to the compendium of determinations and then he talks about how these uh, precepts belong within the oral tradition and he says they're divided into the special and general precepts and uh, the uh, general of the uh, general, sorry, of the special precepts, they are then also what not to do and what to do, what we should avoid doing and what we need to take on. And um, uh, he, um, he uh, Jay Rinpoche cites the great final Nirvana Sutra, I think it's a Mahayana Sutra, those who go to refuge um, in the three jewels come closer to the truly virtuous they never go to other deities for refuge. Those who go to the sublime teachings for refuge harbor no harmful or murderous thoughts. Those who go to the community for refuge do not associate with non-Buddhist philosophers. Now, initially, this sounds like, you know, okay, this sounds a bit um, deeply prescriptive, but what we're looking at, uh, if we think about this in terms of, for instance, the Ten Commandments in, in, in uh, classical Christianity, um, there is like, you know, thou shalt not um, worship another god. And here we see is, you know, don't go to other deities for refuge. So let's unpack that a bit. I'm, I'm not making this up. This is straight from Jerome Shea. So he says, we do not want to go to other deities for refuge. Um, uh, we should definitely uh, abandon harm and malice towards living beings. And we should not befriend non-Buddhist philosophers. 
However, if we want to know what that means, not going to other deities for refuge is explained as follows. We should not really, as Buddhists, having taken refuge in Buddha, we should not really hold worldly deities such as Vishnu and Krishna and, and, and so on, and, and uh, the, the Christian God or, 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 or Allah as our ultimate refuge, our final refuge, uh, because our refuge is in Buddha. However, this is not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here are the Nagas or the local deities or the hungry ghosts or the spirits, um, which, uh, we, which we then seem to take refuge in. So specifically, there are those times when people are actually taking refuge in um, or, or uh, completely having full faith in um, these sort of small local uh, deities or local beings um, uh, uh, without really considering the fact that in the end, Buddha is, the, um, is, is, is who we've taken refuge in. But then he says, and moreover, while it is improper, proper, it's improper for us to entrust ourselves to these beings without our own strong conviction in the three refuges, it is proper to seek their help. So even within the, cons the consideration that there are people who, 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 who sort of develop a strong relationship with uh, hungry ghosts, local deities, nagas, and so on, um, then even with the, and as, as well as Vishnu and Krishna and, uh, and Allah, is that it also is to say that we don't discard them. We, we, we can seek their advice. We can talk to them. We can, we can uh, 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 work with them. And he says, um, if, for instance, an example would be you could seek the help of a benefactor, um, such as getting a job, or you could consult a doctor without having to for, for ha having to accept them as your as your true teacher, your dharma teacher, right? So similarly, there he's saying is there's nothing wrong with with that, but one needs to think about saying if we're taking refuge in Buddha, we trust Buddha to be uh, uh, fully enlightened, and this is the qualifier for us. So it's not like um, uh, uh, therefore you must reject everybody else because I'm a jealous Buddha, <laughs> but and I don't mean to take I don't mean to take umbrage at anybody for for different faiths, but in terms of the Buddhist condition uh, 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 traditions, then there is a, quite a large leeway uh, in terms of being able to pray and in, engage in spiritual actions which do not involve Buddha, as long as one's refuge remains stable. He then says also. Uh, the second prescription, which is a uh, prescriptive precept in uh, refraining from doing harm or injury, ahimsa, again, through thought or deed. And this includes actions as, and then he goes through a list of actions which are primarily concerned with uh, the treatment of animals, and so especially the treatment of the beasts of, beast of burden. And he says beating, binding, imprisoning, uh, nose piercing, and, over, and overburdening. And he says this is also true of both humans and animals. Um, nose piercing is primarily, he's not talking about um, uh, you, you, you might um, um, want to get your nose pierced, right? It's not like that. He's not talking about that. He's saying that essentially we, um, um, uh, if you have an ox and you stick a, a ring um, or a bull or you stick a, a, a ring into the bull and you use it to drag the bull around, then this isn't so good because essentially we're disempowering these animals, we're not giving them the option or the choice. Uh, we're not giving them the freedom or liberty that they do, that they have every right to have. And I, although he doesn't mention it, the same sort of thing would be involved in uh, doing other forms of unnecess unnecessary actions to animals um, that are some done sometimes done on certain dog breeds. Uh, that there are you know tails chopped or whatever, not because the the dog needs it, but because that's how the dog is to be seen then this is really not correct. It's got very bright in here suddenly. I'm okay. So these are the things what not to do according to the oral tradition and what to do, how to be. Um, the first is, he says, there are three of these. Uh, the first is to treat Buddha's um, images of Buddha, sculptures, paintings, and so on as objects of reverence. So he says, uh, as as they were, the, as if they are the teacher themselves. But this does not mean that we treat them, we we see them as being the teacher. So this is an important aspect of 
um, certain, some sort of religion, say, you know, like, um, um, uh, you know, they, they, they worship idols. And it's like, no, well, not really. Uh, um, we don't recognize that the uh, sculpture is Buddha. We, we do recognize that the sculpture represents Buddha. And um, again, this is about opening our hearts up rather than necessarily uh, creating a, 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 a some sort of um, icon worship or whatever. Um, it's to remember and to retain our memory of of, um, of Buddha and enlightenment. So he says, um, he says, uh, Nagarjuna's uh, uh, a friendly letter says, um, the learned worship and image of the Sagata Buddha, um, whatever it is made of, even wood. So uh, 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 traditionally, wood was considered, considered to be a less valuable material to make a, a Buddha statue out of, and obviously gold and precious metals and so on are much, much sort of superior, superior. And in many places, one finds it's important to say that when one is um, a considering or, or, or recognizing uh, uh, this statue as Buddha, the fact that one is made of wood and the other is made of gold should not be uh, uh, should not be relevant to us. Um, There's a story in the in the um, Sudraka base of discipline, the Vinaya, it's a Vinaya text, um, uh, that um, after um, Krakachanda Buddha, there's a Buddha called, uh, going way back, and um, Krakachanda, um, uh, uh, when he had gone into um, when he died and gone into Paranavana, they um, the king at the time, King Kalamat, um, ordered that a huge stupa be built. Um, and uh, a, a workman cursed it and twice and he said um, we'll never be able to finish the stoop of this big it's too big um, and he was quite angry about this uh, and he um, when it was finished when it was finally finished um, and he he regretted having spoken so aggressively and he uh, took the, all the wages he'd been given for his contribution, and he um, paid for, to have a, 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 gold, a golden bell added to the top of the stupa. Um, and uh, uh, according to this text, anyway, which is um, attributed to Buddha, he was then, um, our uh, Gautama Buddha, he was then reborn as a uh, Supriyavat, which means uh, sweet voice. Um, and he had an ugly uh, appearance and a tiny body, but in an incredibly beautiful voice. So he's saying that this is a sign that really, in the end, the curse had left this effect. Uh, his uh, the remorse and the and the willing to undo had produced this uh, other effect. Um, therefore, he says he sh we should not quibble about the quality of images, um, especially of Buddhas, um, uh, um, and we should not. Um, despise others or deprecate others for the materials that they've chosen to use for those images um, and, and and also likewise discourage people from continuing or discourage people from from um, helping them uh, best really to keep up our, our mouth quiet if we have anything to say um, the, or, or uh, if we have nothing positive to say best really to keep quiet right so in these sorts of things um, because if we think about it the faith of the individual and their project, they might be doing something which is just too big, too complicated, too, uh, too, too complex. And we might think, you know, they'll never make the money for that. They'll never raise the funds for that, or they'll never finish it. And when we start saying these sorts of things, we are what we say can have an impact on those people. And this can diminish their faith and regardless of what, or, and also their convictions and even their practice. So regardless of, of the sort of the karmic consequences, as it's often written, we can very easily see a, 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 a causal tr tr uh, chain where what we say can lead to a diminishing in, in, in the, the, the larger project of all, all beings developing enlightenment. And this is really what matters most. So in the end, it's like saying, if this were the case, 
um, that we only needed to worry about whether or not we've got an ugly body. Yeah, okay. But actually what we're doing is we're saying this diminishes our project, the, the, the great project of enlightenment to all beings. So we don't want to have a negative impact on that. After all, this is what we are practicing. This is the choice we have made. And then uh, Jaramsha gives us a, a case from Tibet, and there was a yogi called Jangchuk um, Rinchen, and he um, was a student of, or a friend of, a teacher uh, who wrote the Lamrim, the early uh, um, preliminary Lamrim. And um, he um, showed a statue of Manjushri uh, to, to a teacher, and he said to him, how good is it? If it's, a good, if it's good, I'll buy it for four coins, quite a lot of money. Um, um, uh, uh, for the four gold coins that uh, Rombagagiwa, who is a, 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 another friend of his, he, he's given to me. And um, Atisha took a look at the statue and handled it very gently and said, Lord Manjushri, his, his body has no defects, but the sculptor is middling, right? So, and, and then put the Manjushri on the head and then gave it back to, uh, uh, it gave it back to Jungtra Rinchen. And it isn't actually said whether or not Zhang Shukrinch and then decided to, to, to part with his hard-earned cash, or his, his hard-earned cash. But we date the uh, the sort of uh, the suggestion is that he thought, no, okay, I'll I'll wait a bit longer rather than anything else. Um, and uh, uh, um, uh, Atisha always always would make a similar comment. He would never ever uh, he would always say any time he was asked a question about a, a, a painting or a statue or whatever he'd always bring attention to the buddha um that the statue represented before making any any comment whatsoever so this is a this is a prescriptive precept about developing a sense of of respect uh, or uh, um, a, a level of uh, relationship with is and remembering a Buddha. And then the second one is to, uh, again, not show disrespect for writings, and specifically writings on the Dharma, uh, on the teachings. Um, and he says, even those composed of as little as four words. So it might be there's a scrap of paper which has four words on it, Dharma words on it. And then uh, these are. Uh, um, and it, again, it's not specifically like if you've got three and a half words, then it doesn't really matter. Or you've got you know, it, five words, it's worth even more. It's primarily just a way of saying even a few letters, not very much on it. And um, uh, um, he says, uh, we, as, uh, in terms of our uh, precept of refuge is not to show this disrespect. Uh, we should not pawn uh, volumes of, of scriptures. Um, uh, um, uh, um, so obviously pawning is a thing in Tibet. I, I, I don't know people who would pawn scriptures, but maybe. Um, also treat them as merchandise um, uh, to sell. Place them on the bare ground um, or in dishonorable places, which means in the toilet or the bathroom or in the kitchen. If it's a working kitchen and it's messy, then it's better. If it's a kitchen table that's clean, that's okay. But if it's a something like that, again, to put them on the ground where there's dirt uh, uh, and where they're going to get stained is no good. Um, putting them on the ground, even on the floor where it's dusty or where it will get dusty is no good. Um, again, he says to carry uh, texts together with um, shoes. So if you've got your text in one hand and then you put your shoes there, that's not so good. Or on, with stuff on top, like shoes or, or uh, um, undergarments. Again, one shouldn't walk over them, tread over them, step over them, or allow them to be stepped over. And therefore, we're responsible for put, putting our books uh, where people will not walk over them um, and, uh, uh, and uh, treat them um, with the respect as if they were the great uh, teaching jewel itself, the, the Dharma, the Dharma jewel, the greatest uh, jewel of all. And I think the point about this, uh, uh, for me, I, 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 again, um, I should have taught this when I was 15 years old. Um, so yeah, I was like 45 years ago or so. And, and um, um, 
since then I've always been very aware of all books, basically of trying to keep them off off the floor uh, and not allow people to tread on them or to make sure that they're somewhere safe. I don't always manage to to get that right, um, but I do my very best. And there are all sorts of complexities with this. So, for instance, when we have a situation where we, um, especially in the modern world, where there are newspapers or used to be newspapers everywhere, then if we see something that is on the newspaper that's been laid out, let's say, for instance, to do some paint work, like a picture of uh, His Holiness or Buddha or some text, then it's a good idea to take that and remove it so that it 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 um, becomes um, not walked on, not trodden on, and so on. But then, of course, that leads us to the question of saying, well, what do we do with all this paper? Because we live in a consumer society. Of course, in Tibet, there was very little paper, and every single piece of paper had its place. And there are various different um, ways of dealing with that, but I'll go back to that in a minute. So in terms of uh, the relationship that we're having with the Dharma in terms of scriptures, uh, Jay Rinpoche talks about uh, Geshe Jengawa, um, again, who, whenever he was, when he was young, whenever he saw any scripture being carried, um, so by the monks or whoever, he would always stand, stand up and he would bow until the scripture had gone. Um, and when he was older, then he'd just join his hands like this. He didn't stand up. There was also a case where um, a teacher um, met in Ngari, as a place in Tibet. In Ngari, there was a, um, um, a, a rather well-known mantra practitioner, and the mantra practitioner wasn't really convinced that a teacher wasn't just some trumped up Indian teacher coming over sort of with all his, his ideas. And he was sort of felt that, you know, while a teacher had been um, uh, uh, um, well respected by many, he hadn't seen anything himself that was really impressive. Um, so initially he was not really interested in listening to people would say, you know, you're going to come see your teacher. He's, you know, he's, get, he's giving a, a talk and it's like, no, I don't want to. Thanks very much. Uh, you know, I don't know him. Don't know him. Um, anyway, so one day though, he was in Ngari um, and uh, he saw a teacher um, rubbing a page of the text with his teeth, he's cleaning his teeth with a, a page of the, from a corner of a page of text like this. And um, much that we do our best to be tolerant, a teacher couldn't quite bear it at all. And he sort of said, hey, please don't do that. Don't do that. And uh, the, the mantra practitioner of, of Ngari saw this. And he thought, okay, this guy, I'll go to his teachings. And he went to his teachings after that, because he said, okay, you know, this guy is actually serious. It's not just doing whatever everybody expects him to do. Um, and uh, uh, Shawara, uh, Shawara, another uh, Tibetan from, from the 12th century, I think, said, uh, you know, we, we play around with the teachings in so many ways. Uh, we sort of, uh, you know, treat it with so much uh, already um, showing disrespect to the teaching and its teachers ruins our wisdom. Now, considering we're stupid already, let's try not to create more stupidity. Uh, stupidity. If we become more stupid, we won't be able to do anything at all. So this is the idea primarily that, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, we need to be, we need to sustain respect. So what do we do if we have a vast amount of Dharma? Uh, materials because we live in a consumer society and we um, and uh, we don't know what to do with them because I don't know maybe somebody's given me a whole lot of uh, Buddha rupas or, or, or a load of texts or whatever so obviously one of the things to do is to help for those who want them or, or who have a who have a need for them who are going to be able to use them and are able to respect them then of course we can give them to them that's no problem at all um, but then, of course, the, the responsibility is to make sure that the person who we're giving them to is going to treat them well as well. Um, and so uh, this is why it's often good for us uh, not to have too many Dharma objects, because then we have to look after all those Dharma objects. I think uh, we know about it. Some of us know this already. <laughs> so, so 
then it's like saying, okay, what can we do? And there are different, there are different traditions about this, but one of them, for instance, in Tibet was to build Marni walls. So Marni walls are these carved stone walls, and they'd lay a, a high foundation with these Marni walls, and then they'd fill the Marni, uh, the, the, these caverns, the areas within these Marni walls, with all the texts that um, were, were superfluous or, 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 or uh, of, of um, less value in terms of practitioner right now. So they want to respect the Dharma, but then they've got like, let's say um, in Tibet, a typical case might be that the pages of a text were eaten by rats, or that they were became water damaged, or fire damaged, or all the or, or sometimes there's a print run and a whole lot of them gets the ink spilt all over them and it's like well what can we do with this because it has words on it so we still need to be careful of that so one thing to do is to use Marni walls but of course then you end up with and we can find in the Himalayas 50 60 70 ki, ki, uh, kilometers of Marni walls filled with all of these pages and stupas and so on so it's like okay well maybe um a sort of <laughs> what is it we have uh the HS2, right? The great big, the new HS1, HS2, these high-speed rails. Maybe we can get um, the government to sponsor Marnie Wars that are running around this, but I don't think it's going to happen. So um, instead, then, is like using fire. So fire we can burn if, as long as we don't mix it with rubbish. We don't just have a rubbish fire. And we say, okay, we're treating with respect. Let's go, no, no, no place to this. And build the fire up, keep it away from the earth and burn it and then use um, um, a transformation mantra like a Om Mah Hung or to, um, to pray uh, to Dharma and say, may, may, may this Dharma, uh, um, uh, you know, may this uh, bring a long life to the Dharma because at the moment there's no, no ability for anybody to look after it correctly like this. So one has to be very, very careful about this um, in order to meet the precept of refuge of looking after and respecting the Dharma. But also it's important to remember just these simple rules like um, sticking books underneath one's cushion or uh, prayers underneath one's cushion or on the floor or all of these things. And you see often in, in especially in Buddhist uh, contexts, everything is on stools or tables and uh, in terms of texts um, and nothing is then left on the floor. But if we're... Um, uh, if we're not used to this and we've had a whole lifetime of living with books all over the place, yeah, fair enough, okay, you know, but it's just to remember this is primarily uh, one of the ways in which we want to begin to try to think of generating a sense of respect and demonstrating a sense of respect uh, uh, um, as a behavior to the Dharma. So then the, again, the third uh, uh, prescriptive precept which although it's prescriptive, it's sort of done in the negative context of saying one should never ever revile or despise members of the community, including renunciates uh, like uh, cave dwellers or, 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 or uh, monks or nuns, um, even those who merely possess the symbols of a monk or a nun, not necessarily, so if you're dressed as a monk or a nun, but you have no bow, um, and uh, he says even the mere parts of the robes of the uh, uh, four monks and nuns should be treated as uh, 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 with care. Um, but he says more importantly, don't do not divide um, yourself and others into opposing factions, and, and and in the process viewing the others as enemies. So one, uh, it, it, it's absolutely fine if one is uh, involved in a in an organisational dispute where there is a difference of opinion about something. Then of course this needs to be resolved, and it can be resolved harmoniously. But to then sort of say oh, they're wrong, they're bad, they've got it, they're, they're they're evil. This is a mistake. So the idea is to say what we're not doing is is allowing division or encouraging division or divisiveness um, because they're practitioners. So as practitioners, we need to do our very, very best to sustain and maintain a non-divisive attitude. This can be very, very hard, um, but we've got to do our best to say, OK, I can recognize we have a dispute. I can recognize we have differences of opinion. Uh, I, have, I recognize there are uh, uh, different ways of looking at this. But I believe or I hope to be able to either reconcile this or to be mutually able to continue because these people uh, uh, and our, our people and those people 
we're all practitioners. And again, this goes across faith, not just within the Buddhist faith, not just within uh, uh, one uh, a tradition or, you know, like Lamrim, or, 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 uh, but right across. So the idea is to say, uh, for us to then say them, they're wrong, they're bad, we make a mistake. And we have to be very careful of this. And I've caught myself doing this. I, uh, you know, we all are continually needing to remain vigilant um, uh, and, to, and to be determined not to allow ourselves to get carried away with this sort of language or thoughts. And he says, um, he quotes from the exhortation to the wholehearted resolve. Uh, it's a, a, a sutra, I think. Um, Those dwelling in the forest desiring good qualities, in other words, practicing, um, should not scrutinize others' faults. They should not think, I am superior. We are the best ones, right? So you have this thing of saying, well, we're the forest monks. Yeah, they're not as, we're much better than the, than the city monks. All right. It doesn't even, I mean, you find this everywhere you go, right? I mean, you have it in the monasteries, in, in, in the large Tibetan monasteries, you have these huge monastic universities, and you have all of this, like saying, you know, we're, we're this and we're such and so, we're much better than that and such. And they do this a lot. So, um, you know, there's a sort of an idea of uh, where, where, um, where uh, you know, where, where, um, where, the, where the best, where the greatest. But of course, really, it's fine as a joke. Uh, but when it starts becoming real, and that's a big a bit of a problem. And he says, having this arrogance um, of saying I'm better or I'm superior, yeah, or we are, you know, or, yeah, like Chelsea, you know, the best or whatever it happens to be. If we do this within a, especially with a spiritual practice rather than a football team, um, then. Uh, uh, this arrogance is the root of unruliness. It's the breakdown of uh, of, of collaboration, um, and it creates um, a trouble for liberation in our path and their path and everybody who's involved. So it's just really not worth going there. Um, he says instead, if you look at like John Tompa, who is the uh, a lot of teachers primary student, on on Jabachimpo. When they saw even a small scrap of yellow cloth, um, which is a, a monastic cloth, then they would pick it on the path and lying on the path or something. They would they wouldn't step on it. They pick it up. They wipe it down. They put it in their coats or whatever, and then find somewhere clean to put it. So in this sense, the idea is primarily to generate a sense of respect for our refugees, the Buddha Dharma Sangha. So this is the special refuge, uh, special precepts, and then we have the general precepts, of which there are six. Um, and again, uh, one of them is to uh, go for refuge by recollecting the distinctions and good qualities of the three jewels repeatedly. Um, I think he goes into a little bit more detail about that. Uh, yeah, he does. Okay. Um, to um, uh, recollect the great kindness of the three jewels. And by doing that, continue to um, to worship um, and and also to offer the first portion of our food and drink. Um, this doesn't mean that we should end up throwing away food uh, because we've offered it, but to remember and to be mindful of and to recollect the um, Buddha Dhamma Sangha whenever we're about to eat or drink. So um, you often see a um, monks or, 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 or other practitioners and they'll hold their tea. Sometimes they cuddle it like it's like they're cold, right? And and this and it's like that's not it. And the point is to say, you know, uh, just offering my uh, offering my tea or offering my coffee or offering my uh, drink or water um, to Buddha Dharma Sangha before I take a sip. Yeah. And likewise with food. So we don't need to um, we don't need to do some huge, great, big, long puja. I mean, there are plenty of them if you want to find uh, prayers for doing prayers and so on, but um, you don't need to sort of hold up your plate and go Whoa, like there's anything. It's quite easy enough just to, to not even have to bow, but just to say, to recognize the food and to think to oneself, you know, take whatever you want, right? This is enough. So we, it's all internally, not, 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 um, not, not, uh, uh, we're not trying to show off. 
<laughs> look, I'm a Buddhist. Look what I do. This is not about that, right? It's what we're doing here that matters. So uh, being quiet is fine. It is not about making a fuss. It's primarily just to say, okay, yeah, I remember this. I want to offer how I want to offer food. We'll take whatever you want, and this is yours to have. I'm very happy to do that. So again, he says, uh, establish other living pit beings in the practice by considering with compassion. I would say em empathy as well. So there's loving kindness, nature, recognizing and developing again, not just non-harm. Non-harm is a key principle, but underlying principle, but then also opening ourselves up to a sense of generosity and kindness. Again, recognizing that loving kindness is the, uh, uh, generating loving kindness is what enables us to feel the loving kindness we'll need as a Buddha, but also loving kindness, this sense of love uh, and attention of treating others as equals, as, as, as absolutely as, um, as important as ourselves, uh, it, it is, um, um, allows us to uh, meet them. And by meeting them, we then have uh, a, a, a kinship, yeah? So this is really this is a, 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 um, a really important because essentially um, when we're developing our this loving kindness, we do uh, more and more. We we end up trying to meditate, uh, especially later on when we're meditating on developing body cheetah. Um, we need to develop this loving kindness that extends to all beings without exception, and on the basis of that, we then use uh, the compassion. We do not wish um, any harm. We wish to help benefit all beings and we need to do that from a real a real sense a real strong sense and that basis that compassion basis of recognizing that we are all caught in this turmoil of wrong view of 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 ignorance of crazy thoughts of of um of misery of of, of antagonized self-grasping and when we recognize that within ourselves and having developed this loving kindness and compassion, we then actually feel um, that loving kindness or that compassion for others. It's easy enough when we can recognize our own delusions, we can then we can see just how bad the situation is. Right. And that's at that moment, we then can really start talking about taking on the responsibility of all beings. So we are looking at this sort of basis of saying we want to um, uh, gen be gentle, friendly, but not just friendly in terms of or gentle in terms of impotent or, or, or unable or, or, or wussy, um, but in terms of meeting the specific needs at the specific moment in a way which is absolutely uh, relevant, direct and loving in the moment. So not uh, uh, proper kindness, not just easy, wishy, washy kindness, right? So uh, there's a, a, a lot of uh, so a lot of stuff in terms of Western Buddhism, which can be pretty wishy washy and almost sort of almost kind of passive aggressive, right? And we're not doing that. We're not talking about that. We're saying quite the opposite. We're saying, we need to be honest, we need to be direct, but we've got to do that from a basis of, of, of loving kindness and compassion. This is the practice. This is our, these are the, these are the precepts of refuge. It's easy enough just to be sort of, you know, gentle and uh, all the time and really actually, uh, 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 not deal with what needs to be dealt with. Right. So again, he says, talk about, um, it's important, whatever activities we engage in to, to make applications and, to, and to make prayers uh, and to make offerings rather. Uh, 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 and prayers to the three jewels again, without without uh, uh, um, without uh, a sense of stinginess. So this is about opening our hearts, uh, uh, developing a sense of love, and and um, when we recognise these benefits, then also uh, we um, rather than just um, doing it out of uh, some sort of ritual or because we're told when we begin to recognize how refuge helps us in terms of our strength and in terms of our practice, then then it's good for us to refuge, go to refuge three times in the morning and three times at night. So the normal, the formula, the refuge formula used in, in Tibet 
Um, a, a, a normal refuge formula uh, used across the world is Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dhammaya, Namo Sanghaya uh, in, um, in Sanskrit. Uh, and that said th uh, three times in the morning, three times in the evening. And in uh, the Tibetan system, it's normally Namo Guru Biai, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dhammaya, Namo Sanghaya. Again, because of the emphasis on the teacher. And it's because of this em emphasis on the teacher that the guru, Guru Biai, is I, I take refuge in the teacher, um, uh, and then the Buddha, and then the Dhamma, and then the Sangha. That uh, some people used to call Tibetan Buddhism Lamaism because it was Lama means guru. So in a sense, it's like saying the distinguishing feature of of, of Tibet is is that it's um, that it recognizes the importance of the teacher, but the Buddha, but the, the Tibetans said we're being called Lamaists when we're Buddhists. So they felt that this was not really uh, 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 um, that it was missing the point. Um, but that's um, maybe a historic thing now. So then to sustain and um, our, our refuge and not to for, forsake, forsake is quite a, a nice sort of archaic word, but not to give up our refuge in the three jewels, um, um, it, even as a joke, uh, or if it costs us our lives. Now there's a case, um, I remember being told there's a case where uh, when uh, monks are learning to debate, they do this, like this uh, debate uh, um, to help hone and develop their minds um, clearly about their thoughts and their, their understanding of the text they're studying. Um, they're told that on the debate ground, you are allowed to um, to say that the refuge is worthless because it might be a part of the the um, the debate that you're saying that you're trying to 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 bring out uh, um, the uh, clarity in the opponent, but in in every other case, including in joking, then this is not the case. So there are some specific areas where we can say say you know in for the for the purpose of developing our minds more sharply, uh, or, or or that of the um, our fellow uh, our fellow practitioners. Um, then sometimes we can say this as long as it's recognized that this is not really a, a, a personal position, right? So it's more to do with helping us develop our mind rather than saying, oh, yeah, no. So he says here that it is important for us to recognize and, and, and keep in mind what makes a Buddha a Buddha and what makes a Buddhist a Buddhist in terms of um, uh, following the path to Buddhahood. So it, it, while uh, we are inclusive about faith, at the same time to recognize that uh, that a Buddhist faith is Buddhist and a Buddhist faith is not therefore some sort of pan pantheistic sort of higgle piggle, it doesn't really matter, everyone's a Buddhist sort of mindset. It's actually saying no, Buddhism actually means something very specific. Um, and uh, Buddha Dhamma Sangha is very, very specific and a Buddha and enlightenment is very, very specific um, in terms of recognizing us as, uh, as engaging in the spiritual path, that's shared. In terms of recognizing um, the, the benefits that can be reached through developing such a path, that can be shared. In terms of recognizing the distinguishing features of what makes a fully enlightened Buddha, possibly not so much yet. So those those are sort of the areas what we which we do need to consider and, and we need to be aware of where where the lines are, but also in our sense, and I feel this is important is to allow ourselves to develop that with honesty, rather than just to close off or and reject or also just to buy in without necessarily recognizing or, or understanding. So it is far better for us to, to, to find our path based on a reliable experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So then he says, Re recollection of the great kindness, of the three jewels, we should we should offer the first portion of the food and drink. And he goes into more detail about this. And he says that essentially um, food is a is a great symbol for a representation of the kindness of the of the uh, of the of the three jewels. And therefore, 
um, making offerings in order to repay that kindness, or as I said, is in terms of recognized and to sh share and open our heart, our, our thoughts, our love towards uh, uh, the three refugees. And then goes into specific details about the continual offering or the offerings that we can make. And he says, the offerings in terms of to the Buddha's body means um, actually making offering, offerings to uh, a form or a, a painting, um, offerings to stupas, um, offerings to a perceived object means we might not actually have an object in front of us, but we can imagine an object in front of us. And he says, and then, and then um, a, a, um, sorry, my bad. Um, perceived object is offerings to those which are actually perceived. Sorry, I, was, I made a mistake. So those objects which are perceived, such as uh, stupas or Buddhas that we can see, statues that we can see, offerings to non-perceived are those which are not actually present, not even in a symbolic sense, um, uh, uh, materially, um, but we, um, we um, uh, imagine them. But also, if we ha uh, imagine offering Buddhas, and al although we can Im we can uh, sort of say well, all the Buddhas there are in the universe, all the stupas are in the universe, all, all of those. Now, although they we can only perceive a few of these, um, then if we're doing it in that large uh, as a universal sense, then that they then belong to a, a non-perceived. And we're very very specific sort of detail about what is perceived and non-perceived objects of offerings. Um, and he said it's normal for us to make offerings both to what we can and cannot see um, or, 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 and imagine. Therefore, um, uh, typically is to say, you know, I make offerings to all Buddhas the three times and the stupas, the, th the, the ten directions of the limitless universe. So ten directions is a, is a classic, uh, Asian classic uh, uh, um, uh, uh, breakdown of um, uh, the four uh, cardinal directions, the sub cardinals, northeast, southeast, and so on, and then also up and down. So that gives us up the ten directions that uh, are mentioned again and again in 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 in, um, in, in um, Asian literature. So um, not just Buddhist, there's also many other different religions have a similar ten uh, tenfold direction thing. And he said, if we make offerings to a perceived object. There's a, a vast amount of merit that's generated, um, making um, offerings to an unperceived object even more so. If we're able to make offerings to all Buddhas and stupas, even more than that. So he's saying when we make a, 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 an offering to a Buddha or an image in a shrine, then to uh, think about all of the different Buddhas there are. And also, ideally, he says, you know, we want to do this with some sense of uh, understanding of emptiness according to our ability also within the context of uh, for the purpose of all sentient beings rather than for ourselves. And then this has a very, very dramatic effect. Um, but, and then there are also those offerings which are made by ourselves when which we ourselves do it. Um, those by proxy where we ask somebody else to do it and so on. Um, and he says, there's a case where uh, we often are in a situation where um, or we might be in a situation where there's a young child or our own child or whatever, and we say, you know, Ooh, you make the offering to Buddha. And this can be very beneficial for both you and also the child in this sense too. Then offerings of wealth and service are where we offer to, you know, uh, we uh, look after a, 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 a monk or we keep a, a shrine clean. This is service um, uh, where we're providing a service of, of cleanliness or, or, or of uh, tidy, keeping something tidy or uh, looking after somebody's health. Um, offering of wealth is where we actually hand over uh, wealth uh, in all its different uh, types rather than um, just a few. Then there's offerings of activity such as prostrations, uh, just even putting our hands together, um, moving um, in a clockwise is a very, very traditional thing of moving clockwise around a, a holy site. Um, and in terms of Im Im imagine, and then there are also inexhaustible gifts, such as not just wealth, but inexhaustible. And this really means land. So uh, especially arable land fields where there's always more crops available from from the land. And this is considered to be very, very good. Um, but also 
jewel, earrings, bracelets, he goes on to, uh, even a spool of thread, um, he says, is, is a great offering to make. And what's known as vast offering is when we offer over a, um, a long duration of time. So we, we repeatedly offer um, many times. And in, indeed, actually, many people take on a commitment to offer the seven water bowls um, every day um, or do their best to offer seven water bowls every day. Um, and this is a part of, of generating the sense of the vast offering in terms of this um, offering uh, uh, benefits. Um, Then also offerings are, uh, should um, not be contaminated with the afflictions and um, and ideally these are made um, by yourself or in a similar way um, uh, with somebody else um, uh, not but not making anybody uh, make the offerings out of contempt or carelessness or laziness so for instance, I can't be bothered to do this offering, you do it. This is really not so good, um, if you mean it. Um, res um, making an offering respectfully, without distraction. So, you know, make the offering without sort of checking your, your email or whatever. Um, and uh, free for the afflictions in terms they're not mixed with attachment or, or whatever. So when we are actually making an offering of wealth, and this can be quite, I mean, this is something I I've, have experience with, when I first made an offering of wealth um, uh, to Geshe-la, as it was, um, I didn't have very much money and, I, and I'd saved up quite a lot uh, to make this offering. And there was a part of me that sort of slightly, <laughs> sorry, slightly wanted to hold back. And I saw it and he saw it. And he said, well, are you sure you want to let go? <laughs> and I was like, yes. And it, as soon as I saw it, it's like, yeah, no, this is a gift. This is really what I want to do. So it was absolutely fine. And, you know, this is this is what I wanted to do. This is fine. This is, we're allowed to choose to do these sorts of things. And this is what I wanted to do. And I felt very happy about it. Um, but there was this sort of slight, like, tight, uh, sort of tinge of, of, of like, mm, I want to keep, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he was very good about it. And then um, more, and but th having done that, then later on, uh, like in Ladakh, and being able to offer um, a, a, a larger amount of money to, for instance, um, a, a, a Rizal Rinpoche, absolutely no problem at all. So we do see that as we get more used to it, then then in fact it, it can, becomes easier to be able to do these things. And I feel, uh, uh, you know, the the. Um, the Ladakh is like saying, "Oh, you're gonna get, you're gonna get bonuses. You're gonna get new, you know, like this." I'm like, "I'm no, I'm not, because I'm giving this to practice. I'm not doing it for anything else. I'm not interested in sort of. Uh, it's not like some sort of spiritual bank account. <laughs> the purpose is for all beings. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> no problems. <laughs> There's nothing special, you know. It's just after practice. When we begin to practice, we get more familiar with it." It gets easier and, easier and easier for us to be able to do that. And obviously, there are things then, uh, particularly like not to offer stolen goods um, or, or, or things which have been contaminated, um, things that we would not want to have um, to offer those is a mistake. Um, it's like, you know, uh, again, is to sort of say, you know, well, he's my spiritual but dustbin isn't really very good. So that doesn't really work either. So, so oh, I've got all these Dharma books now. I, I'll give them to this teacher. It's like, hang on, what? <laughs> yeah, it's not right. So, and then he also says, you know, we don't need to just offer those things which are material. We don't even need to offer those things which are um, imagined. We can, uh, or like in terms of, of specific objects, we can also offer um, uh, a beautiful day, the beautiful day, the, 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 the wonderful clouds in the sky, the flowers that are around us, uh, the fruit that we're tasting or see, uh, the trees, um, uh, natural features, um, and you know, incredible landscapes. All of these, uh, uh, even the pattern the sea makes on the, on, uh, you know, the sea makes in, on a breezy morning. All of these things are offerable 
to the to the three to the three jewels saying you know oh I, I wish I, I you know I want to be able to share this with you right so now we have photos so you just like oh photo and then put it on Facebook right <laughs> so it's like, it's like okay, well, if I want to put it on Facebook, if it's that nice, well, what I can also offer to the Buddha, the Buddha Dharma Sangha, right? This is fine. I can do that. So then, um, uh, and then the offering of practice, and again, this is offering of practice. Really, in the end, is the best. But it, we can do all of these things as well. It's not like we need to say oh, I'm only offering practice. It would be a mistake, right? And offering practice again is like um, recognizing and considering. Um, Recognizing the four immeasurables of uh, uh, um, um, equanimity, um, uh, uh, loving kindness, uh, compassion, um, and um, uh, uh, and a, a, a sense of responsibility to liberate all beings. Um, then also to the fourfold uh, the fourfold division of the teaching, the primary with that all um, phenomena, composite phenomena, are or products are impermanent. Um, all contaminated things are suffering. Um, all phenomena are, are selfless um, or empty. And nirvana is peace. So this is the basic formula that is built into Buddhism. And if you, if you want, they are sort of the four, the four um, established truths. Likewise, to um, develop um, a sense of an awareness of the three refuges. Um, uh, the, the six perfections, um, um, admiring and uh, uh, admiring emptiness, and 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 developing a fixed a, a fixed con um, um, contemplation without um, conceptualization, um, uh, sustaining and maintaining our vows of ethics, our ethical vows. Um, there's actually some real value to. Um, taking a vow so uh, it doesn't you know if we take a bodhisattva vow then there's 18 root vows 46 minor vows and so it's quite a lot to take on but sometimes it's like saying okay I you know uh, and one wants to be able to sustain it so we need to be able to know what we can actually keep and and therefore it's like saying I have taken a vow that I take a vow against um, um, drinking alcohol okay so even then then it's like saying okay now this is something I will not do again and we will find there will be situations where even the uh, the vow that we might think are very easy for us to take ethical you know that makes an ethical difference um there will be will be times when we'll be pushed so we have to be quite strong and that's the whole point is to say the vows help us to establish the the continuity of our practice and the the value that a vow has is that while I am sustaining the vow, I am sustaining that practice. I'm sustaining that practice of the vow. But to break the vow is very is dramatically weak. So it's only of value while I am able to continually sustain it. And therefore, once it's broken, the vow loses some of its strength. Still, it's good to remain ethical. Of course, if I, in general, I don't want to drink and without taking a vow, then whenever I um, am given an opportunity to drink and I say, no, I don't, I don't drink, that's still very, very positive. It's very good. But the vow is actually a, a, has an affirmation, sort of um, a, a continuum to it, which actually has some sort of a, 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 a consistent benefit. And it's a bit like saying, you know, I haven't, I, I haven't drunk for 25 years. That being able to say that actually has an effect. And this is, you find this in things like the 12 steps and so on. I mean, it's not, it's not specific to Buddhism. This is the idea we can see it as having a very powerful effect on us in terms of a, a recognition of something I've managed to achieve. And our vows. Um, and then stri meditating on striving and practicing the factors of enlightenment, leading ourselves to to uh you know to keep on the path so he says that really in terms of offering a practice um we should uh, try to do this um uh, at least as long as it takes to milk a cow so i think we're definitely um looking at 14th century texts here <laughs> and the translators have very kindly written <laughs> 10 to 15 minutes <laughs> in case 
<laughs> in case we aren't really sure about how long it takes to milk a cow, because I wouldn't know. <laughs> So 10 to 15 minutes is a good time to do some daily practice, right? And then what we choose to do, we should think very carefully about what it is we're choosing to do for our daily practice. We can change it, but it's good to do that once we've determined and we've finished doing what we've done. So we may say, okay, well, for the next week or so, I want to concentrate on developing uh, an awareness of impermanence or, or death awareness or precious human rebirth or the three refuges or karma, or, or, or emptiness, if I have some understanding of emptiness, or bodhicitta, or loving kindness, or all of these things, and say, okay, I'm going to do 10 minutes of one of these things, and then and then spend 10, 15 minutes milking a cow, or uh, time uh, thinking about that daily. This is very, very good. This is actually, uh, some people say, that in the end, really, this is what makes, makes us trained practitioners, being able to sustain that practice. And he says this, these different types of offering that we've gone into great detail with, this is to make a complete offering. So being able to do all these different things is very important for us. Oh, how are we on time? Oh, we're running out of time. Okay, I thought we were going to finish this week, but we are not. So I'm not going to try and rush it this time. We've got a little bit left, just three or four pages um, of uh, the precepts of refuge. and some of the benefits of being able to practice th these precepts and um, how it helps us in our journey, which is lovely. And then we're moving next week, we will move on to the general characteristics of karma and we'll begin to really work on understanding what karma means and likewise, what it does not mean. So um, that is what we're going to do next week. Um, otherwise, I think, yeah, I have three minutes. So I think um, let's dedicate any uh, benefits of today's thoughts, considerations um, to our practice in terms of developing a stronger practice, looking to benefit all beings, working to Buddhahood, if we can, um, and establishing that ability to sustain a containing, gen uh, 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 loving mind that reaches both to ourselves, but also to, also to all beings. And then let's um, again finish with uh, just a just a couple of minutes of of uh, of uh, meditation. And let's uh, if it, uh, obviously again if you prefer to do breath awareness, otherwise let's just sort of work on um, an appreciation of the Buddha. Yeah. <laughs> 